Hey, online doctrine class, this is Mr. Bareford. This video is an attempt to very quickly go through as many of your questions as possible on sanctification. You guys had some questions so far. I put a bunch of them on the screen. I'm going to try to tackle these as quickly as I can. First one, justification versus sanctification. What is our role? In justification, our role is sin. That's all we can do. As an unbeliever, right, as somebody who by my sinful nature, ever since the garden, I have original sin passed down to me. Adam and Eve are the only beings who have ever lived who have experienced what it's like to be not sinful other than the new man, Jesus Christ. He's never sinned at all. But Adam and Eve knew for a while before the fall what it was like to be not sinful. And then they fell. And that fall, that sin, is now through genealogy, right, through heredity, passed down to the rest of us. I was born as sinful, and there's nothing I can do about it. What can I offer God? My sin. That's my role in justification. His role, this is why it's monergism, is grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So in my justification, I offer God nothing. He offers me everything. He died for me, right? He became a man, lived a perfect life, died the death I deserved, and was raised, promising that I too would be raised through faith in him. What is my role in sanctification? In sanctification, this occurs for a believer, I am now alive. So while I was dead in my sins prior to Christ converting me through his spirit, now I'm alive in Christ and my spirit is revived. So in sanctification, I do have a role. The Holy Spirit, just as he called me to faith, he continues to build me in my faith through the word, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper. But I also have responsibility in sanctification to cooperate, which means I don't neglect or disdain God's word or baptism or the Lord's Supper. I go to these things. I confess my sin. I receive God's free forgiveness daily offered to me through his external word. What actually constitutes a good work? Um, this, is, this gets really confusing for you guys because you're seeing distinctions like civil righteousness versus, I think your book calls it Christian righteousness, which I don't, I don't know a better term, but that still feels like a weird term. Um, a good work is what you, know, you and I would expect. You know, it's something that is in line with God's commands. Right? It's loving my neighbor, not hating my neighbor. Um, not stealing from my neighbor, but protecting his property and his goods. You know, not committing adultery, right? but rather being faithful to my wife and those around me. Not bearing false witness against my neighbor, but speaking of my neighbor in the best light in every circumstance. I mean, th those, those are good works. Now, it's only a good work if it's done in faith. And since only Christians have faith, this is why scripture says that really only Christians can do truly good works in the eyes of God. So as an unbeliever, can an unbeliever do good work? Yeah, you know, comparing man to man, an unbeliever can do good, in a sense, God-pleasing work. It's, it's God-pleasing when we abide by his law, but if we don't have faith in him, that it does not, it's not righteousness. And you have to understand that even the works done in faith, while they are righteous, they don't earn anything, they don't merit anything. Only Christ can merit and earn my right standing with God. So what actually constitutes a good work? Anything done in faith out of love for your neighbor. That's it. Anything done in faith out of love for your neighbor. It's inherently selfless, not selfish. Is there any unforgivable sin? Um, just the one that Christ mentions, right? So all sins are forgiven through Christ. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The unforgivable sin would be to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That is, as the Holy Spirit throughout your life calls you through God's law to can repent of your sin and through his gospel to believe in Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of your sins. As throughout your life, you reject and reject and reject and reject that. And to your dying day, you reject that. You will die in your sin. That's the unforgivable sin. You rejected the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't get the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God is one, but three persons are God. No man could make this up. This is just how God reveals himself in Scripture. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us to baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. So the Holy Spirit's the third person of the Trinity. He's fully 
equally, completely God, just like Jesus and the Father are fully, equally, and completely God, not part God, not one-third God. And the Holy Spirit's role, as revealed in Scripture, is, you know, as aforementioned, to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. God uses his law, and the Holy Spirit uses that law to convict us of how awful we are. We don't believe we're awful, but then we look at the Word, and the Holy Spirit uses that Word for us to realize, I am awful. By nature, I hate God. By nature, I'm an enemy of God. By nature, I don't want to do what God says. I want to do what I say. I, I want to be God. The Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin, and then the Holy Spirit also calls me to faith. The Holy Spirit is the one behind conversion. He's the one behind perfecting my faith, too. In other words, throughout this life, as I see my sinful heart softened and changed, right? Create in me a clean heart, O God, says um, the, the uh, King David, right? And cast not your spirit from me, he says at another part, right? That's because it's the spirit that creates in us a clean heart. It's his sanctifying work through the external word of God. Is sanctification a now thing or a not yet thing? Both. Am I sanctified? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified. Are you being sanctified? Yes. Will you be sanctified? Yes, right? And that, and that probably sounds confusing, but that's the way scripture talks, right? I'm saved, and on the last day I will be saved from the coming judgment when Jesus returns to burn this world with fire and make everything new, right? I'm sanctified, I am set apart, I am holy. And for the rest of my life, God will continue to set me apart and make me holy. And on the last day, I will be perfectly holy, no sin at all. What should I do if I, um, if I still can't have strong faith even enough? I learned many things a lot about God. Okay, so I think what you're saying is you know a lot about God, you feel like you understand you have faith, but maybe your faith isn't strong enough. Um, Jesus says, you know, faith of a mustard seed, which is a really small seed, can, uh, can move mountains. It's not about quantity of faith. You believe or you don't. If you believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, don't worry about whether or not your faith is weak or strong. Know that your Savior is strong and he keeps his promises. If you're putting your faith in him, you can't go wrong. Nobody who calls Jesus Lord will be put to shame on that day. Can sanctification be achieved in limbo or only when we are alive on earth? All right, limbo shows up in Dante's Inferno which is trying to mix Christian theology with really um, what I would consider pagan theology, pagan mythology. Um, limbo is not a Christian thing. So real quickly, here we are on this earth, this life. As a Christian, when I die, my body will be sleeping in the ground and my spirit will be with the Lord. When the Lord Jesus returns on the last day, he will raise all the dead and my dead body will come back to life, be united with my spirit once again. And as a believer, Jesus will take me with him to the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, body and spirit to live there forever with him and the rest of God's big, big family, all the sleeping saints. Um, so limbo is not in the Bible. Explain spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts are something that the Holy Spirit gives to his church for the building up of the edification of the church, the individual members of the church and the church at large corporately. So these gifts, Paul mentions a lot of them in different books. They show up quite a bit in 1 Corinthians, teaching, prophesying, tongues, which by the way is speaking in different human languages, helping is a spiritual gift. Um, all of these things are for the building up of your Christian brother or sister in Christ. They're for the building up of the church. We all have them. Some have more than one as Christians, um, but they're never to serve our own needs. They're to serve our neighbor. Ha explain civil righteousness versus righteousness before God. Um, Jesus is righteous before God. And as I put my faith in him, I am seen as righteous before God. Even though I'm not, he says, yes, you are. And I accept his testimony because he's God, he would know. Civil righteousness is my righteousness before man. As I love my neighbor, as I'm, as I'm kind to my neighbor, as I take care of my neighbor, as I show concern for my neighbor, that's being civilly righteous. As I obey the laws of the government, that's being civilly righteous. That's not being righteous before God, that's being righteous before the governments of man, my fellow neighbor. How does baptism play into justification and sanctification? Which of those two is it more of a part of? I think of it more as a part of justification, but it plays a role in both. So baptism is where Christ offers his external word of promise attached to the visible sign of water. You see Peter talk about this in Acts chapter 2. He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Right? And then he proceeds to say this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. Right? So that is a promise to us, and where there is forgiveness, there is justification. Where I am forgiven, I am right before God. So 
I don't say, you know, I was baptized on such and such a day. I say, I am baptized. I stand right before God because I am baptized by him. And in that, he makes me promises that he will not break because he's God and he can't break his promises. He's promised me that my sins are forgiven, that I have received his Holy Spirit, and he's the author and perfecter of my faith, and he will hold on to me until the last day. And those are promises I can bank on. That's justification. How does baptism play a role in my sanctification? As I remember those things, and I don't consider consider my sin in those times of weakness, but I consider Christ's righteousness and his promises as I remember that I'm baptized, I remember that I'm justified. And that's part of sanctification, remembering that because of what Christ says to me, promises to me, I am justified. That's very much part of what it means to be sanctified, trusting in Christ's promises. Why is the sanctified life difficult? Because you're still a sinner and we're all still sinners. The nicest Christians we've ever met are still sinners, even though they may not be sinning as much with their mouth or as much with their eyes or as much with their hands, we can't cure the sin in our heart. The only answer to the sin in our heart is for God to crucify us with Christ and on the last day raise us again. My heart will finally be free of sin on that day, but between now and then it's still sinful and I can try to curb that sinfulness with my words, with my actions, but I can't, I can't cure it. So why is the sanctified life difficult? Because I am simultaneously a saint, sanctified, sanctified by God, and a sinner, still wishing I was God and wish I, I could do things my way. How can one keep their faith in God strong all the time without worrying? You can't. We're weak. We're still sinners. This is why we constantly need the Word of God to remind us of the gracious promises we have in Jesus Christ. We need to be in church. We need to be hearing the good Word of God, His law damning us of our sin, and His gospel saying, You do not stand condemned. Any who believe in me are forgiven of their sins. Christ who died for me, bled for me, rose for me. Why does God create us inherently sinful and then punish us when we do what he created us to do? We are not inherently sinful, right? Go back to Genesis 1 and 2. God made all these things in six days, including man, and he said they're all good. I am not made inherently sinful. I am made good. But I inherited sin from Adam, not from God but from Adam. And because I inherited sin, I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I will sin. Now, does God punish me for my sin? Nope. God took the punishment himself. God poured out all his wrath, all his anger against Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ being punished by on the cross? God the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was God's wrath that Christ was paying on the cross for you, for me. So God doesn't punish me for my sin. The punishment has already been paid by someone else, my Savior, Jesus Christ, your Savior, Jesus Christ. How does preservation work? Preservation, or sometimes perseverance, is the word ascribed to the Holy Spirit's work to keep you in the faith. And he does that through the external word, the external promises spoken by Jesus in the Bible through your baptism and through the Lord's Supper. How are people who believe, are people who believe in Arminianism still saved? So Arminianism is this idea that God has done all the work for me, but anytime you attach a but to that, realize that you've just strayed from biblical theology, but I still need to at least choose him, believe him, accept him into my heart. Understand that if you're at a point where you're choosing God, believing God, accepting him into your heart, you're already saved. You didn't become saved that moment. You were saved before that because your heart would not choose God, would not accept God, unless the Spirit has already called you. So your heart is sinful through and through. And if that sinful heart full of hatred for God suddenly finds itself wanting God, loving God, believing in God's promises through Jesus Christ, it's already saved before it asked. Okay. So Arminian, Arminianism has this very confused and it, it, it kind of portrays it as if we have a role in our conversion, but we don't. We're dead in our sins, says the Apostle Paul. We were enemies of God, says the Apostle Paul, before Christ reconciled God to the world. Why is perfectionism and faith a misguided teaching? Because it's not biblical, right? I am a sinner the rest of this life. I will never be perfect in this life. But Jesus is coming, and he is making everything new. And on that last day, I will be made new. If he returns during my lifetime, read 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, I will just be changed and my heart won't be sinful anymore, and my body will be completely new. If I'm a dead saint, I'll be raised, and I'll be completely new. But in this lifetime, while things are still old and new, 
before things are completely new and Jesus returns, I'm still a sinner. So it's a misguided teaching because it's not biblical. Why are we prior to conversion God's enemies? Isn't that a bit harsh? Yeah, reality, <laughs> that's reality. Reality can feel harsh, but it's the truth. Believe the truth, not a lie. Um, I'm not somebody who, you know, by my sinful nature, doesn't know how I feel about God. No, that's not what the Bible says. By my sinful nature, read Paul in the book of Romans. Read him in Romans 3. No one seeks God. No one is righteous. Not even one. All have turned away. All are haters of God's law. And Paul makes that really clear in the kind of language that he uses, right? He says the, I think he says like the venom of, you know, asps of snakes is on our lips. And if you hate God's law, you, you hate God. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you know, the doctor gives you a prescription. Hey, this is what's good for you. And you're like, yeah, I'm not going to follow that. You don't believe him. You don't trust him. You don't think he's good. You think you know better. And that's how it is with God. If we look at his law and we go, I'm not going to follow that. And you don't believe him. You don't think it's good for you. You don't think it's good for others. You're going to do what you think is best. That's essentially hating him. So you got to understand that when it comes to, uh, you know, us being God's enemies, this is this is not you know my idea. This is not you know Bareford being harsh. This is straight from God's word, straight out of the mouth of Paul. Um, even Jesus talks this way. Look at uh, John seven or John fifteen. Do a Google you know do a Bible gateway search for the word hate, and look at John seven and John fifteen and what shows up there. You know Jesus came to the world and the world hated him. That's you and me, apart from the Holy Spirit calling me to faith in Him that I might believe and love Him. What attacks us in our sanctification? Uh, my own sinfulness, right? Um, I can, I can be an addict to something, or just you know my own sinful desires for things. Satan, Satan is real. Demons are real, and they tempt. Um, this world, you know, this this world, our culture is sinful, and there's so much sin available in our culture, and our culture tries to tell us that sin is okay, left and right. So a lot of things attack us in our sanctification. Do other denominations of Christians see conversion and sanctification differently? Oh boy, do they! Um, yeah. Yeah. If so, are these denominations positively wrong, or is there a possibility that they have the correct view of this topic? I don't. I don't think it's good to see it in the light of you know this denomination versus this denomination. Just what does the Bible say, right? And what we're teaching you in doctrine class, it's what the Bible says. And 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 if you disagree, the challenge is where where did we get it wrong? Where does the Bible not say what our purple book is teaching? Where did the purple book teach something? and it misquoted scripture, or scripture doesn't back that up, find that, right? When the purple book's saying Pelagianism is heresy, semi-Pelagianism is heresy, you know, Arminian, that gets it wrong too. Synergism, that gets it wrong too. It's monergism, that's the correct view of conversion, not any of those others. And then it gives you scripture verse after scripture verse to back that up. We were dead in our sins. What can a dead person do? If it's not monergism, we'd be still dead in our sins. If God alone wasn't acting to call me to faith, I'd still be dead in my sins. Compare those verses to what we're teaching and you're going to see a match, right? You compare Ar Arminianism to the Bible in an honest light. Do I still have any power or aliveness in my human will? Look at the Bible. The answer is no. Um, my human will is sinful, dead. My spirit is dead because of my sin. Uh, does God forgive continual sin? Yes. The question is, Will you continue to believe if you continue to sin in that manner, right? Sin is bad for your faith. It attacks your faith. This is why scripture is so adamant in exhorting people not to sin, is so adamant in staying strong in faith. Sin is bad for me. It's bad for my neighbor. It's bad for my faith. God forgives my sin, but if I continue to sin, God, it, and scripture says, you know, God, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What you reap, you sow. If I reap sin, that doesn't sow, you know, that doesn't sow faith. That sows doubt. That sows opportunity for Satan to attack me and accuse me of my sin, because I am indeed sinning. Um, how else can the Christian find strength for daily living other than communion and absolution? Well, understand that the power of communion, the power of absolution is in Christ's word. So the strength for daily living is really in the promises, the words of our Savior. So as recorded in the Bible and the Gospels, we need to be reading these things. We need to stay in God's word daily because it shows us our sin and forgives us of our sin daily, right? Strength comes from God. He has given us his word. We go to his word. His word is attached to other things like the pastor's absolution or like communion or like baptism, but it's all rooted in the words of Jesus. Does God love those who have done bad things unconditionally? God so loved the world that he sent his only son, right? That whoever believes in him shall not perish 
um, but uh, have eternal life. So yeah, the, the condition is that God loves Jesus. And if you have faith in Jesus, God loves you, right? And that's it, right? There's no other condition, right? God, the Father, has handed over all judgment to the Son. You see this in John chapter 5 and 6. How does the Son judge, the, you know, judge us? How does he judge our works? The work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. That's straight from the mouth of Jesus. That's the condition. And even that condition, that belief, is given to us as a gift, right? Read Paul in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Do those who have not heard the word of God but would have, I think you meant would have believed, um, would they would they go to hell if they would have believed it? You're kind of getting into like this alternate future that didn't happen. Um, I don't know how to talk about hypothetical realities. You know, if, if you haven't heard the word of God and you don't believe it, you know, who knows whether or not you would have. And whether or not you would have is not, that's not reality. What was reality for this person is that they heard the word of God. They, they didn't believe it. And yeah, if you, if, you, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, there's no other way, right, to be saved, right? Um, Jesus is clear on this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Apostles P Peter is clear on this. There is no other name given under heaven by which man might be saved, just Jesus, right? So heaven and hell are real. Jesus is the only way to heaven. We're all bound to hell if it weren't for Jesus opening the door to heaven. He says, I am the door. When we confess our sins to God, are all of our sins passed um, past and future uh, forgiven. Yes, read First John, right? Um, if we deceive, if we, if, if we, um, if we say to ourselves we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive us of all unrighteousness. I think I butchered the first part. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. God is faithful, right? We confess that we are sinners just like his word says we are, and he is faithful. He forgives us of our sin through Jesus Christ. That's my past sins. That's my present sins, the sins I'm committing right now. That's my future sins. All sin is forgiven in Jesus Christ. He paid the punishment. He bled. He died for all of it. I do not understand the meaning of bearing the cross, right? So this concept of bearing the cross is persecution, suffering, opposition, because you're a Christian, right? Jesus says, you know, the world hated me, he says to his disciples, so don't be surprised when they hate you. You will have trouble in this world. The world will hate you when you testify to the truth of me. So as Christians, when we speak God's word, you know, both his law and his gospel, the world doesn't want to hear it. The world doesn't want to hear that this, that, and the other is sin. They want to hear that all those things are fine. Just do what feels good. The world doesn't want to hear that Jesus is the son of God who was raised from the dead for your sins because that means they are sinners and they don't want to hear that they're sinners. And they don't believe that this guy named Jesus was the true son of God. They, you know, and the fact that we believe that makes us, you know, stupid. It's obviously a scientific fact that when people die, they stay dead unless it historically happened that he really was risen, and it did historically happen. Resurrection, historical fact, empty tomb, lots of eyewitnesses, it's talking to Jesus, speaking with Jesus. So bearing the cross is persecution, suffering that a Christian faces simply because they're a Christian, because they believe what they believe, testify what they testify to, God's law, God's gospel. All right, my favorite question, I know good work is what God wants us to do, but how do we know what God wants us to do? I just follow my heart. God doesn't talk to me to show what I should do. I love it. It's like straight out of Napoleon Dynamite. Just listen to your heart. That's what I do. Um, yeah, God gave us a conscience. Sometimes our conscience is correct and accurately reflects the Ten Commandments and how we're supposed to treat our neighbor. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes my conscience makes me feel like I'm okay, but I'm not. God's word is the authority on these things. How do I know what God wants me to do? You read it in his word. It's called the Bible. Right? So what does God want me to do? Love my neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what God wants me to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These two things sum up the commandments, the first and second table of the commandments dealing with how I treat God and how I treat my neighbor. That's what God wants you to do. So don't listen to your heart. Listen to the Bible. Sometimes your heart gets it right. Sometimes it doesn't. All right, let me quickly end up with looking at those questions you guys had in the forum and doing rapid fire answers to those. Since I'm saved by grace through faith for Christ's sake, apart from works, why should I bother to avoid sin? Won't I be forgiven anyways? What does it matter? It does matter. Yeah, you could be forgiven anyways in Jesus Christ, right? You confess, you're forgiven. Um, why should I bother to avoid sin? Because sin still separates from 
separates us from God. Sin still is bad for me, bad for my neighbor, bad for my faith. As I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven of these things, but it doesn't make sin any less damning. If sin weren't a big deal, Jesus wouldn't have died for it. Should I sin less and love more over time? In other words, the longer I'm a believer, should I expect this kind of progress? Yeah, right? But if you don't see it, you know, that's the law, you know, and when you don't see it and you're disappointed in yourself, good. That's the law working on your heart. So return to the gospel. Jesus died for you, a failure. He died for me, a failure. He's the only success and his victory is my victory. His victory over sin is my victory over sin. I'm not going to have personal victory over sin. I get victory awarded to me in Jesus Christ. I didn't earn it. He just hands it to me, gifted to me as a better word. If I notice that I'm sinning less, especially in a given area I struggle with and loving others more, should my apparent moral improvement be a source of reassurance for me that I really am saved? No, right? Your source of reassurance should be Christ's promises because he doesn't break them, right? So when Christ forgives me in my baptism and the Lord's Supper, just through his words themselves that I am forgiven, um, that's my reassurance that I am saved because he's not a liar. He keeps his promises. What if I struggle with the same sin my whole life? Am I not a real Christian? If you're struggling with sin, turn to God's word, right? So not turn to myself and look inward on myself. Man, I why am I still struggling with this sin? Do I really have faith in Jesus? That's Satan attacking you. Don't look inward when you're struggling with sin. Look at God's word. Yep, you are a sinner. And yep, I died for you. And you're forgiven through Jesus Christ. So of course you're a Christian. I saved you. You believe that because I saved you. I called you. I'm sanctifying you. You've been baptized in my name if you haven't been baptized. You've received my supper. And I'll talk about those things more in a minute. Uh, is becoming more like Christ, that is more obedient to God's will and more loving towards others, is that something that I do or is it something that the Holy Spirit does in me? Should I look at my becoming Christ-like as something that I'm responsible for or as something that God promises he will do for me? Both, but start with start with that first one, right? That God promises he will sanctify you. Now that you are alive in Jesus Christ, as the Spirit is sanctifying you, you're alive and you can cooperate or not cooperate, reject or not reject. And not rejecting looks like actually hearing God's word and listening to it. Going to church where you hear it preached to you. Going to church where you're reminded of your baptism. Going to church where you receive Christ's body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins, right? That's what it looks like right? To, uh, to participate in the Holy Spirit's good and gracious work to remind you that you're forgiven, to give you a new heart, right? Um, neglecting those things would be what it would look like to resist the Holy Spirit, right? To not cooperate. So it's both, right? God promises he'll sanctify you. And now that you're alive, your spirit's not dead because you've been converted. Um, you can cooperate or not cooperate in those things. Um, I think I said I'd talk more about the idea of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So real quick, those are just external means. They're called means of grace. They have God's words, Christ's words of promise attached to them. And they serve as tangible, solid, historical reminders for me of my forgiveness. Not just spoken word, but experience too, right? So I don't just hear Christ's promise to me. I am baptized in his name, and that can't be undone. Mr. Bareford can't be unbaptized. It's a historical moment. It's done. I receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of my sins. I, you know, it not only is the word spoken to me so I can hear it, but it's, it's also given to me so I can taste it, eat it, digest it, and I can't untaste it, undigest it. You know, I received his body and blood. I partook it. And in those things, he made me promises. And that's a historical moment and it's done. And I can count on those tangible experiences because God has attached promises to them in baptism and the Lord's Supper. So more than just external word, but external word with visible sign, with personal experience, objective experience in historical reality, not inner feelings. So those things are things I can bank on. Christ keeps his promises to me in his word and baptism in the Lord's Supper. All right, hopefully this video helped clarify some things about really more than just sanctification, but recent chapters with justification, conversion, and faith, sanctification. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.